Um, they've never met with me. They've never presented their plan really? to me. Mayor Francis Suarez speaks out about the future of the Coconut Grove Playhouse and the Miami Freedom Park and about losing Ultra. The mayor is our guest. You're offering more opportunity for thousands and thousands of low-income families here in the state of Florida, and that's a big, big deal. Freedom to choose. The governor signs Florida's broadest school voucher program into law. Public money for private schools will take that to the round table. It was neglect and um, emotional abuse. Giving birth in a jail cell by yourself despite cries for help. Tammy Jackson did just that. It's another big problem for Broward Sheriff Gregory Tony, who runs the Broward jails. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all. You know, the city of Miami is just one of South Florida's cities, but it is ground zero for many of the issues all of our cities face. And this week has been a big one for the city of Miami as it grappled not always successfully with some major ongoing issues. The Ultra Music Festival told the city enough and it terminated its deal with the city. It's moving on. A long simmering plan to rebuild the Coconut Grove Playhouse came to a boil. The mayor may cool it off with a veto. And the city says moving forward on a no-bid deal with David Beckham and his partners for Miami Freedom Park is underway. It's a huge office park, retail space, and oh yes, a soccer stadium on the side of the Mel Reese Golf Course. Late this week, we sat down to talk about all those things with Mayor Francis Suarez. With us now, Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Mr. Mayor, good morning. Great to have you. Good Wonderful morning. to be with you, Mike and Lana. So let's start with the news this week. Uh, the city of Miami was summarily shocked, we understand, when Ultra decided to end the relationship. Um, shocked in some ways in the way it happened, Mr. Mayor, but, right. um, but it was Miami's to lose what is a, a venerable event. Very controversial where it was. Um, uh, let's start out with what is the fallout from from Ultra's departure, short term and long term? Well, I was always a long term supporter of Ultra uh, as commissioner because I really felt that it went to the brand of the city. Um, it was the highlight event of Winter Music Conference. Uh, and so uh, we were the attention, we had the attention of the world during that week, uh, similarly to, to Basel during uh, our Basel week, uh, you know, for the, for the, uh, the arts community. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, they were negotiated with, in my opinion, in bad faith uh, uh, by Commissioner Carroyo at the Bayfront Park Management Trust, where he uh, negotiated a new deal, then voted against a deal that he had agreed to and negotiated, which forced them yeah. uh, in a very short period of time uh, to have to make Virginia Key work, and it just didn't work. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, so they are gone, maybe to Homestead, who knows, yeah. but the noise is gone, the thumping bass, which drew a uh, a lot of people went crazy over it, including your dad. And myself. Lived, and yourself. <laughs> yeah, but the cachet is also gone, yeah. along with $2 million that Ultra paid the city two every million, year. $2 million, hundreds of millions of dollars in economic impact, thousands of jobs. You know, I was talking to the general manager of a hotel uh, next to the Bayfront Park. And he was telling me that when it was there, they had 100% occupancy, a 40% higher room uh, rack rate. Uh, this last year, they had a 70% occupancy and 40%, you know, lesser. And those are jobs in our community from Miami residents as well. You know, what um, people who are watching this program from all over Miami-Dade and Broward and Monroe counties, the, the story really here is, is a quality of life for residents sure. in communities across our viewing area which host big, important, international, global events yes. that bring mm -hmm. that kind of economic return and panache. Yeah. Where does the city of Miami, which is actually pretty small right. in that area, you know, big name, small city, um, with residents who are very mindful yes. of that, how going forward do you keep that panache as the magic city when you have this <laughs> kind of tug of war? Yeah, ask South Beach that. Uh, it, it's a delicate balance, without yeah. a doubt. And, and I think uh, for us and for me as mayor, you always have to put the quality of life of your residents first because they're your bosses. And so what I always told Ultra from the beginning, uh, before, during, and after the event is, you know, whatever you do, uh, be wary not to affect the quality of life of Brickell residents. And we saw that the noise pollution went way beyond Brickell. It went into the Grove. It went into uh, areas like the roads, Little Havana. Yeah. And that was a big concern. Obviously, the exfil 
issues were also a huge concern, the traffic issues. That, that, first, night, that, that first night of the festival this year was, we're looking at some video yeah. here, people it was, walking three miles listen, from Virginia Key over to Brickell and trying to get it, to it their hotels. It was a hotels. disaster. I mean, it was a yeah. disaster. And I spoke to the event organizers. They got better over the weekend. Um, and certainly there would have been some conditions that I would have imposed had the commission decided not to cancel the agreement. I think they just didn't want to deal with the politics. They've been dealing with the politics of Miami for 20 years and they got tired of it. Can I, yeah. before we move on, I just want to ask one more question related to Ultra. And that $2 million that was the licensing fee that Ultra paid the city, a million of that was yeah. earmarked for that African American Museum yeah. long promised on sure. Virginia Key, right where the event yeah. is. And that goes away now. What, what happens to that project? And let me tell you, uh, that million dollars was already proffered to the Virginia Key Park Trust yes. uh, from the first year. Uh, for some reason, the county has decided, uh, after many years of having that bond money, not to build that project unless and until that there's an operational uh, plan. Uh, however, they subsidize uh, you know, many uh, cultural facilities throughout the county and they have mm -hmm. an $8 billion budget. So that's disappointing. Uh, Commissioner Russell, Chairman Russell, uh, at uh, commission meeting this week, advanced a plan to dedicate a percentage of the funds uh, generated from the island directly to subsidize uh, the, the African-American music. And I'm gonna speak to Chairman Audrey Edmondson in these coming days because I really think we need to do the right thing and uh, and, and build this museum uh, to celebrate our culture and the historic black yeah. Virginia Key Beach. All right, Mr. Mayor, let's move on to the Coconut Grove Playhouse. And I just want to point out, if you live in Tamarack or you live in Florida City, the Coconut Grove Playhouse is just an iconic it regional is. theater, important to everybody in South Florida. Yeah. It's been closed since, uh, what, 2012, I yeah. believe. And now even this before that, before that, and now this week, uh, th your commission, Miami yeah. Commission, voted three to two to go ahead and accept a plan proffered by FIU, right. Miami Dade County, uh, Gable Stage, yeah. to build a 300-seat theater right. uh, and to knock down the old auditorium. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to veto <laughs> that or? Let it go. That's the, the $50,000 question. It is. I have a very big uh, uh, decision ahead of me. Uh, I'm strongly considering the possibility of vetoing uh, the decision of the City of Miami Commission. I have to consider, obviously, all sides. This is one of those decisions where 50% of the people will be very happy with what I do, 50% of the people will not be very happy yeah. with what I do, and that's that's part of leadership. But, you know, we have to understand how we got here, and I think it's important. Um, number one, you know, there are three cultural facilities that I want to save under my leadership as mayor, the Playhouse, the Gusman Center, and the Miami Marine Stadium, and I'm committed to those three things. Secondly, you have to understand the county has had a horrible track record with these kinds of facilities. They were overrun, uh, uh, I think it was a $200 million overrun in the Arch Center, a $40 million overrun uh, with the Frost Museum, and, and now uh, we're in this dilemma where they've done nothing for five and a half years that they've had well, the lease. They've been waiting, they were fighting historic preservationists. They've got $23 million in hand, Sure. and they want to go ahead with this. I think that uh, Michael Spring, the Miami-Dade County Cultural yeah. Affairs Division leader, Joe Adler, a friend of mine sure. at Gable Stage, a uh, friend of yours, I'm sure. Uh, there are just so many people, <laughs> and a friend of Glenna's too. Uh, uh, and, and what they are saying, what they sure. said at the meeting, was something like, either you do it now or right. never, because there yeah. is no really, uh, Mike Edis Edson, yeah. the attorney, has talked about you know, a 700 seat theater, but yeah. there's no money in hand for that. Well, listen, first of all, I don't believe that you do it now or never argument. Uh, I think that's a that's a false argument. Um, I think that uh, the county could and should have already uh, done something. They should, could have built the parking garage. The parking garage is not controversial. It's a plan that everyone agrees with. It's a plan that the business community desperately needs. They could have fixed the facade, which both sides agree and all sides agree needs to be restored. Um, so there's a lot of things that they could have done. They've been uh, p possibly in breach by the state, which is the owner of the property. The state, which is also the owner of the property, has said that uh, the county plan potentially jeopardizes uh, the, the asset from be being delisted from the National Historic Registry. Um, you know, th the mayor's done a great job of, of talking to uh, the Coconut Grove bid, the Coconut Grove uh, uh, Village it's Council. Mayor Jimenez. Mayor yes, Jimenez. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and Mr. Springs, uh, who I know, but Mr. Adler, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the only person they haven't spoken to, ironically, is the mayor of Miami. Um, they've never met with me. They've never presented their plan really? to me. No, not once. 
Well, let's put out a call. We'll uh, break some news <laughs> here. Somebody from the county, contact the mayor, talk about this. What, they got a few days left. I, I'm listening to you talk, and it sounds like you are inclined to veto this. I'm strongly considering it. I'm, I, I want to do. I do. I want to speak to some of the community stakeholders. Uh, you know, my predecessor Tomas Regalado had pledged ten million dollars mm -hmm. of our GOB, which passed. Um, I said in my inaugural speech that I would honor that pledge. So this notion that there isn't enough money—that's another ten million dollars right there. Assuming that the commission approves that. I met with Mayor Jimenez in March of last year because the mayor and the lieutenant governor at the time were at odds over this project. Mm -hmm. And I proposed a settlement which would have given the, 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 the county an additional $10 million. You have to understand, the city has no dog in this fight other than now with this historic preservation. We have actually helped the Playhouse tremendously by extinguishing liens that had they not been extinguished and settled, would have resulted in three million dollars that the playhouse would have to pay in addition to everything else so the city's been a great participant and, in this and process finally wrap this up you have a 10-day window yes. in which to either veto or let it go ahead that's right so, so seven more days you, all right, from so, sunday all right well <laughs> We'll All be right. waiting with beta breath yes, to see you. what you do. Uh, another thing we want to talk to you about that is a South Florida story is affordable housing. Yes. There's some news this week. Let's take a quick break and we'll talk about that when we come back. We are back with Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Uh, talk about affordable housing. This is something that is the number one issue number one. in almost every city in South Florida. And in America. In, in America. And this, uh, and this week, in Miami particularly, may I say. And in this week, you had come forward with, with something called uh, Connect Capital, which is a really interesting idea to build X number of units with X number of dollars take us through what that is because it's uh, it was kind of a coup to get that was it not it, it was and uh, you know I'm on the National uh, Affordable Housing Task Force that was established by the mayor of Washington DC 
and I've also met multiple times with the Director of Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, and they're looking at national models that they can scale up. And so what we've, what we've demonstrated to them is with $100 million with our Miami Forever bond, we can build and renovate 12,000 units of affordable housing in areas where there are climate gentrification issues, in areas where uh, we've identified them close to transit, areas where we know that, that it is easier for people to deal with the other two major expense factors in their home, which is transit and food. Okay, the devil in the details. Sure. This is going to be one of those, and especially in very densely populated areas yeah. like Miami is, it's yeah. going to be one of those where the surrounding neighbors are going to say, hold on, why here? What kind of blowback are you expecting? None whatsoever. My okay. Miami a 21 affordable housing reform that I did as commissioner, which created thousands of uni units of affordable housing <coughs> then, had a 500 foot buffer for affordable housing <coughs> projects that were uh, zone T68 and above, basically six stories or, and above, uh, from uh, single family residential homes. This is about uh, uh, trying to stem the tide of people who feel they have to sell uh, the, the concept of gentrification, which mm -hmm. is a big issue in all major metropolitan mm -hmm. areas. Yeah, this and is, in areas like Little Haiti, if I may say. Yeah. I mean, it's Without a, a doubt. Huge issue there. Uh, Little Haiti, Alapada, mm -hmm. Liberty City, uh, all those areas. So is the, and, and right now, to, to Michael's point, um, residents of Little Haiti are just erupting yeah. over the new project that's going there, Miami World Center. Um, great project Magic in City. Magic City, excuse me, a great project in many respects, but for the people who are yeah. fearful of losing homes that they've been in for decades by no fault of their own. Yeah. So is the idea to move people who are are in those neighborhoods and feel mm -hmm. like they have to go? Or is, it, is the idea to bring in people who can't afford to be here now? Who are, who are you targeting? No, there, there are multiple strategies, but one of them uh, is, is an anti-gentrification strategy, which is allow people to build uh, more resilient homes in areas where they may need to re-roof or they may need impact windows so they don't have to sell. Um, oh. We've seen that model work in other cities. Hialeah did it, yeah. um, where they put a covenant where you can't sell for 10 years. Uh, once you get that, what, um, what amounts to a grant, obviously if you sell, you have to repay uh, the grant, but if you don't sell yeah. um, and you stay in your home, then the grant becomes forgivable. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mayor, I, I, there are many things we could pursue on this, but in the time remaining, we do want to get to an update. We want you to report on the status of Miami Freedom Park, Miami Inter, David Beckham, Jorge Mas, and the partners who want to take the Mel Reese Golf Course and turn a good deal of it into a office business, tech complex, and a soccer stadium. The, What's the, gonna happen? The, the latest with that is we're in the final stages, hopefully, uh, next two weeks of selecting a, a law firm, an outside law firm, to help us negotiate the deal. I am also working uh, continually with uh, the DeLuca family and the First Tee, as I promised to do. They have the contract now to run they, Melrose. They do, and, and I promised from the get-go that I was going to do everything I could to make sure that the First Tee program, which is an excellent program, yeah. uh, um, uh, finds a new home and we're working on that very vigorously so what we what I want to do is follow the will of the people the people have spoken on this uh, they have uh, supported this project in all five commission districts by 60 percent and now it's our duty to to get to bring this product home yeah. for them the, the, the fact that excuse me Glenn I know you had a question here let me jump in and just simply say uh, the fact that city of Fort Lauderdale that yeah. Beckham and his partners it's amazing went up there they have a deal for what used to be Lockhart Stadium yeah. they have started demolition they're working on it. Their training facility is going to be there. So a 305 can, team seems to be in the 954. No, it's going to be in the 305. But I, but I, but I will say something because it's important that you mention this. You know, people criticize, for example, the deal because it didn't have uh, uh, an, an RFP. Right, uh, right, a procurement. Yeah. But they went up there and they procured it in Fort Lauderdale. They've demoed it all in 60 days. And, and that was gonna, quite controversial as well in many respects. Uh, you know, it, it, it may it, or may not have been. But, not but, so much apples to oranges. But I'll, but I'll tell you this, I'll <coughs> tell you this. Uh, they got the land for free. They got a subsidy. In the city of Miami, they're getting no subsidy. They're paying fair market value for the land. Uh, you know, we're going to get taxes, which if you assume a growth rate of 3% is going to generate $4.6 billion for the citizens of the city of Miami. We're going to open up a 60-acre park, 23 additional acres of soccer fields, decontaminate what is probably the most contaminant property of the Miami River along the Miami River. So it's a great deal for the citizens, which is why I think they supported it. So you're saying this. This is the argument that, that we were presenting six months ago before the vote, yeah. and, and the vote went through. And yeah. so now you're at a stage of negotiating that sure. lease and hiring someone you just mentioned yeah. to help the city negotiate the yeah. lease. What are your concerns? So there, are, there are many people who did not support that plan who have many, many concerns. 
concerns, mostly about money and green space. What are your concerns as you hire someone to represent the city in this negotiation? And why can't the city just do it itself? Well, I, I think the city doesn't specialize in doing, uh, you know, real estate, complex commercial real estate transactions with soccer teams. You know, I mean, that's something that's a very subspecialty. And if you're going to be doing a multi-billion dollar ge revenue generating deal for the city, then it's, I think it would be uh, a penny uh, foolish uh, not to have the right type of representation. And we do that in, in all our major deals in the city. So that's, that's totally within the precedent. Uh, but uh, I think what we're looking for is, is that they follow what they promised the voters. We're looking for a deal that generates the kind of economic development that it promised, that does decontaminate the site, that does create a 60 acre park, which will be the largest park in our inventory, 23 additional acres of soccer fields, um, and, uh, and hopefully a tech village uh, uh, to, br to bring high paying jobs yeah. to our community. And save the kids. Absolutely. Program. No, listen, that's a big priority of mine as well. All right, Mayor Francis Suarez, great to speak with you. Thanks for coming in. Number one in small businesses in the United States. I had to say that <laughs> before right. the end of the you, program. You are a... Without allowed. letting us vet that. CNBC. So not right. CNBC, <laughs> National Report. And we got next on for the next week one. in South Florida. How about that? All right, Francis, thanks very much. Thank you, guys. All right, stay with us. Up next, the roundtable. As always, we have so much to talk about and analyze with our powerhouse roundtable. So little time. <laughs> Introductions first. Let's tell you who's with us this morning to break it all down. Welcome to Carlos Lopez Cantera, who served as Lieutenant Governor under the Scott administration. Before that, he was a state representative from Miami and served as the Miami-Dade property appraiser. Mike Abrams is a former Democratic state rep from Miami, former chair of the Dade Democratic Party, and recently in some op-eds, a party critic from within. That was always interesting, and welcome. And welcome, and, and we should point Mother's out. happy Mother's Day to the women in your life who allowed you to be here. <laughs> happy morning. Mother's Day, Mom <laughs> and Renee. <laughs> there you go. We also want to point out that our friend Mike Abrams is mentally acute, but his voice <laughs> is a little diminished because he's fighting a cold, but we're glad you're here, Mike. Well, and Carl's so glad to me. have you here. You've been here as a guest, but uh, first time on the roundtable. So let's, be let's begin with the fact that Governor DeSantis 
came to South Florida on Friday, went to a very, imp I was there, he went to a, an impressive Seventh-day Adventist school mm -hmm. in Miami Gardens, uh, the Kerwin Junior Academy, very, very nice place, signed the bill, the Family Empowerment Scholarship Program vouchers so that about 18,000 kids, low and middle income kids, will get vouchers to go to private and religious schools. Correct. Is this a good idea? Well, I've always been in favor and a believer in educational choice and competition. And this bill creates that program, but also uh, applies the funding mechanisms to the existing uh, Opportunity Scholarship Program. And uh, for the local school districts, actually loosens some of the requirements, some of the, uh, the red tape for their construction dollars. So there's some stuff in it for the school districts, the traditional school districts as well. Yeah, but Mike, the, I mean, I think the question here is, you well know, because you were in the legislature, I guess, when Jeb Bush tried to pass a similar bill, mm. and the state Supreme Court said, you can't do that, that's unconstitutional. Right, but I don't think we could expect the same relief from this uh, state Supreme Court. We all know Governor DeSantis, DeSantis had three appointments to the Supreme Court. I think all the Democratic leftover appointments now are gone. So I would suspect this Supreme Court would be sympathetic to the idea to of school choice. Yes, yeah. That's, you, I do. The, you know, the big question, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, and, and we focus on public dollars for private right. schools. But, but this is the fifth voucher program that the state is using, and they're working. I mean, the, the statistics show from reputable education uh, think tanks that the children whose families use them and choose the school do well, do better. And, and so constitutionally, how do you work around that? Well, from the big picture, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, if you look at uh, enrollment numbers, they've continued to increase. Per-pupil spending has continued to increase. It's not like ev it's not for every one student that leaves saying? the public school system and takes those, those per-student dollars with them to a private school is going to leave a vacuum or a hole to fill. There's plenty of students in the public school system. There's plenty of students in the charter school system. There's plenty of students in the Opportunity Scholarship system. There are plenty of students in Florida, and there are more and more every day. And having more options, parents having options for their children's education is a good thing, and it's playing out in the, in the statistically. But a lot of, a lot of the, the criticism is that you're defunding public schools to fund private schools, but, but is that an either-or question? Well, I mean, there's clearly a finite amount of dollars available for education or anything else in the state budget. And this is kind of like creeping socialism. The campaign, uh, rather, uh, school choice has been growing over years. It is a part of Republican. Wait, explain dorm. that creeping socialism. What do you, what do you <laughs> yeah. mean? I don't well, understand yeah, that. Yeah, I don't that one. Well, I, I don't mean that it's socialistic. I mean that I was just borrowing a term of art. You know, this whole notion that we have to create a parallel education system by giving more and more students choi choice, yeah. that is a concept that's growing and expanding. Originally, it was funded by corporate dollars. Now it's being partially funded by public dollars. Uh, uh, Pico dollars now is avail are available, I think, for capital use. Look, the jury's out on whether this is a good thing. And if the public education system was working the way it was supposed to be working, uh, I, I don't think this alternative would have, would have been created. So clearly there are problems that have led to this. But there are parts of this program that are concerning. It's interesting the governor chose the Seventh-day Adventist school. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. mean that... Only students who believe in Seventh Day Adventism well, go to that school. Of course not. Well, no, actually, of course he not. Has it's the, possible. No, the well, governor well, had three different signings on jump, Friday. Jump, Michael, Carlos, was the, um, Michael was in the Michael uh, was in the Miami signing, but there were three different signings on Friday at three different private yeah. schools and, in, and in, a in Florida, and but and they a, were all different a rabbi, denominations. Uh, Moshe Matz, who yeah. runs a consortium of Jewish day schools, was there. A, uh, a Catholic priest was there. But I mean, there's a lot of support Mike, yeah. and for this. Mike, you said earlier that we have to. It's not that we have to, so we should. We should create the options because, like you said, if the public school system was creating a premier education for every student in the state, then the 
a conversation of uh, an alternative uh, wouldn't even be part of the conversation. And what's happening here is, and this is what is often overlooked in these conversations, is these per dollars, like these 7,800 and whatever per pupil funding dollars, go with the student. So that money would have been spent on this, that amount of money would have been spent on the student if they were in the public school system, and now 95% of it will be spent on that yeah. student, that same student, in a different school system. But it's still the same dollars following the student. Okay, but I, I, I think you missed my point when, or maybe I didn't articulate it well, when I used the choice of the Seventh-day Adventist school as a place for the bill signing. It is possible that students could take this money and go to schools that will not allow people, uh, uh, students of another religion, will not allow gay students because they're faith-based schools yeah. and they don't believe Fair that. point, and, access. And, yeah, and okay, some of these so schools, some know, of these private schools, not just religious schools, you know, they may, they have an option to turn away a student with learning disabilities or other problems, whereas the public schools, if then, you show up at their door, you will be enrolled. And private schools don't necessarily have to roll that way. Okay, and all I'm saying is there's something deeply troubling about that. Also, the requirements to teach at these schools are different, yeah. and the levels of accountability are, are, are different. And it does beg the question, did we over the years also fail the public school system, you know, by not funding appropriate teacher yeah. salaries? Yeah. Uh, look, there are a lot of imperfections in the public school system. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I sent my first two children to public schools. My youngest, I decided that to a private you, school? Yeah, that I had to send it to mm -hmm. private school. But Mike, so, you know as well as anyone it, else that the, the but, subject of teacher salaries can't be determined by the legislature. They can only fund a certain amount of dollars, and then the salary levels have to be, by constitution requirement, collective bargained at the local right. level between the school district and each county's union. So even if the legislature said each teacher shall receive a $50,000 pay increase, they cannot do it because it's unconstitutional because of the collective bargaining rights that the unions have that is enshrined in the state constitution. And that is something that is also yeah. left out of these conversations about teacher salaries. The legislature has tried to increase teacher salaries before, and then they've been rebuffed by the, le the unions and the school districts yeah. saying, no, we well, have to collective bargain well, it the at the local level. And the, excuse me, the legislature in the session just ended added, I believe, it was $300 million for teacher bonuses, which, bonuses will be, are different. W which mm -hmm. are different, but you know, it is more money for teachers one way or another. Anyway, hold your thoughts, gentlemen. We'll be back with more Roundtable in just a minute.
Welcome back to the roundtable. We like to say during the commercial break, you really ought to hear what we are saying. It gets interesting, but it's going to be interesting. Now we're with Mike Abrams of Ballard Partners and also a former state rep and another former state rep and lieutenant governor of Florida, Carlos Lopez Cantera. Carlos, uh, the governor issued his first veto mm -hmm. uh, ever, and it is of the bill that was going to prevent local municipalities from outlawing plastic straws. Miami Beach is one, I think, of seven cities in the state that had said, look, we want to be ecologically sensitive. Mm -hmm. We're going to ban plastic straws because they screw up the environment. Uh, kind of a surprise in a way. A big surprise. Uh, I'm, frankly, I'm surprised that the legislature didn't have some sort of uh, heads up from the governor's office saying, hey, there's either something in this bill that we don't like or we just don't like the bill in general, we don't like the idea of preempting local governments, because it wasn't just plastic straws, that's what it was called, but it also right. preempted it, this issue of the, the family that couldn't have that garden of oh, vegetables in their the front, front yard. yard and yeah. Miami Shores, uh, yeah. Uh, issues of trees, uh, arborists and stuff like that, and the, the, the types of tree ordinances that exist in different cities around the state. There was a lot of preemptive uh, issues in this bill. The straws was just one of them, and frankly, I, I'm surprised that uh, the legislature and the governor's office weren't on the same page on this thing. You know, the governor has done a lot of things in the past couple of months that indicate he is mindful of the will of the people. Uh, you know, what comes to mind, Amendment 4, restoring the vote to former felons. He, he was not for that. Marijuana, he was not for that. But he, as, as governor said, listen, this is what people voted for, and I, as governor, have to abide by that. No, I mean, I think he's been very strategic in picking issues where uh, he could moderate his image and not run too far afoul of uh, the hard right constituency that now seems to be controlling the Republican Party. And, so, Mike, and I give him points yeah, for that. Yeah. I respect him for that. He has the highest approval rating of any politician, elected official in the state of Florida. and. Um, I think he's earned them. I think in the first four and a half, five months, he has really shown a different kind of leadership than we have seen with all deference to your former old <laughs> boss. <laughs> he's done very well. Uh, but I, I do think this veto, uh, uh, my good friend, uh, the former lieutenant governor, does have a good point in terms of whether the governor gave, should have given the legislature a head up. Heads up, maybe he didn't know he was going to veto it until he sat down with staff afterwards. But the veto itself is consistent with his pro environmental stance. Yeah, it's so I don't, with say, I don't think anybody should have been shocked yeah. by He's it. He's definitely come a long way from that campaign commercial of uh, sitting there and reading uh, <laughs> the, the Trump book to his child or building saying, the talking wall about building the wall and the lock. So yeah. that's it's definitely far from, very far from that. And I think there's a lot of people in the state who are happy. Well, okay. one thing we'll agree on is he has a great lieutenant governor giving him advice. <laughs> <laughs> she is a wonderful lieutenant governor. She's right. definitely doing a much better job than her predecessor. <laughs> 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 so, but she's an yeah. Impressive person and very, very strategic and and uh, shrewd, and I admire but Lieutenant she's Governor a human Jeanette being Nunez. Yes. Uh, and happy Mother's Day, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. Right. If you're watching, hopefully you're so with your we, family. Uh, can okay. we bring it home a little bit? There's a there's a an issue that um, is in the news right now in internal affairs in BSO uh, that uh, our station and Laren, uh, one of our reporters, um, had broken, and he talked to this woman named Tammy Jackson, whom you will see, who gave birth as an inmate in the Broward County Jail in solitary confinement last month. Um, the story she unspools of what she went through alone giving birth in solitary confinement is horrific. And um, the sheriff now, Gregory Tony, uh, has this internal affairs investigation as corrections is in his purview, Carlos Lopez Cantera. It, the jail system, of course, not set up as a health care system, but a very com an important component is health care and humanitarian care. W what do you make of what went on there? Well, definitely a horrific, horrific uh, scenario that uh, nobody should should have to endure. And for the for your viewers, uh, any any inmate that is 364 days or less is uh, responsibility of the county jail mm -hmm. system and 365 days or more, the state uh, Department of Corrections. Uh, but reading that story, and, and it was a multiple hour 
labor. Uh, yeah, seven uh, hours. That she had. 3.16 a.m. to there 10 were, a.m. There were screams that could clearly be heard by other inmates, other pregnant inmates mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in that same area. And there's, there's just no excuse, really, frankly, uh, for the people who were, or the, the officers that were on staff that shift. Now, I think uh, uh, the sheriff is, I think, out of his honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. uh, Clearly. He's been in yeah. office since yeah. January. Many things yeah. that are now, now, whether or not he at, has yeah. gotten around to changing leadership, changing policies, or ad adapting his, adopting his own policies for the jails, that's, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, he's going to do it now. But if we're going to hold him to the same standard that his predecessor was held to, which mm -hmm. is the buck stops at the very right, top, right, right. Yeah. then he has something to answer. I for, just absolutely. let me let me just say I just realized Laren is a friend of mine. I never said Larry Livingston broke this story. So Laren Livingston is a reporter at Channel 10 who is uh, doing an amazing job investigating this. Just want to get that out there. But Mike, the the um, contracted healthcare component of the Broward County jail system has some culpability here. I imagine. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure the resources aren't available. Uh, this is the intersection of two massive societal failures, the need to reform our prison system and to the, the need to recognize and address that we've got a mental health crisis in this country yeah. that crosses, you know, every, every economic income line, yeah. crosses all parts of society, and we're just not addressing it. And we actually. should point out that um, uh, Ms. Jackson, by her mother's account, is bipolar, may have other mental health issues, mm -hmm. and had addiction issues, which is not to justify anything. This was just an incredibly inhumane situation where for seven hours she cried out for help and Oops. she didn't get any pain. Yeah. A uh, quick break. We have uh, more roundtable coming up. Stay with us. We are back with the round table with our friends, Mike Abrams and Carlos Lopez Cantera. Carlos, you spent eight years by the side of then Governor Five. Rick's, five years, excuse five years. me, with 
uh, then Governor Rick Scott. Now he, of course, in the Senate. And he has become, I take it because of his several trips down to Colombia and to the border with Venezuela and went to Argentina, he really has become a strong advocate for uh, aggressive U.S. help, humanitarian aid for Venezuela. Mm -hmm. But now this week, Friday, in the Washington Post, he wrote a strong essay where he all but called for U.S. military intervention. Uh, what is your reaction? Why Is this the Rick Scott you knew? Well, let's just say that uh, the very first uh, that I can recall event that Rick Scott did on Venezuela, I was there with him. Uh, we did it in Doral along with yeah. Senator Rubio and... Um, I was there, I remember you that. You were there, you yeah. were there. I, th mm -hmm. I don't know if you were there. You were not there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's for um, sure. And this issue is, you know, that was five years ago. So mm -hmm. fast forward five years, not much has changed. It, it can, it's definitely something that frustrates. I mean, just look at the Cuban American community and the Cuban exile community they've been frustrated for 60 years. Yeah. Well, what, excuse me, what did happen is Juan Guaido yes. appeared on the scene and a legitimate opposition formed, and yet Maduro will not let humanitarian aid into a country where uh, 30 million people, well, a, a, at least a million people need the medical aid, need the beans, the rice, mm -hmm. the other supplies. So yes, we understand why Senator Scott is frustrated. And he's not the only one. Michael, no. I mean, there's a lot of frustrated people uh, in the Venezuelan community, in the, oh my goodness, in just in America, frustrated with what's going on with, uh, with Venezuela, with Cuba, to an extent what's happened in Nicaragua. And you, you know what was really interesting, though, is when the senator first broached military use, it was for humanitarian, to, to bring the humanitarian supplies across the border that wasn't getting through. And even the suggestion, his suggestion of using the military to bring supplies made a lot of people, including our other senator, Marco Rubio, say, well, you know, uh, stop for a second. Putting a military across the border, even in a humanitarian sense, is a sign of aggression to many people. Oh, for God's sakes, I mean, the, the American people should be cynical about any suggestion of uh, the American military involvement, um, especially if it's cloaked in humanitarian reasons. We are so badly overextended around the world. We got Americans, and this was one issue I happen to agree with President Trump on when he was a candidate. You know, we have Americans dying in countries that most Americans never heard of. Um, we've, uh, we can't take care of our veterans. Uh, there was a report the other day that there are 6,000 incidents a month of veterans who suffer PTSD yeah. attempting suicide. So this cavalier notion of sending troops to another country uh, just doesn't make sense now. If the OAS supported it, or if it was a U United Nations mission, right. and it, there, you know we had broad diplomatic support, then perhaps we would want to be part of that kind of effort. Well, the problem is you have countries like Venezuela on the on the um, human what's the, the name human of the rights commission. human rights commission of the United Nations, which yeah. is a joke. Yeah, it's a joke. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the, uh, the so senator also largest violators are on this commission voting on on human right. right issues. When he was here, Rick Scott was here in um, Southwest Dade for an appearance not too long ago, and on Venezuela, and he he used the word genocide going on there. Is that is that a word that you might use to describe the situation? It's I wouldn't call it genocide. It's a, that's a strong word for what's happening mm -hmm. there, um, but by no means is what's happening there. Good in any way. I mean, it's a horrible situation. It's, it's people are sort of starving. People, it's not amazing. Amazing. people it's are literally state, being yeah. run over by uh, yeah. state-owned mm -hmm. assets by Ma Maduro's military, who a social are crisis. influenced strongly influenced by the Cuban intelligence services as well. So you know what's going on in you, Venezuela is absolutely horrible. People are dying simply because they are trying to seek yeah. freedom. They're trying to seek the basics, basic necess human necessities that yeah. we take for granted every day. Things like food, water, toilet paper, the I mean. The fabric of the infrastructure has yeah. come Medicine, apart. yes, yeah. it's all falling it, apart. It, it, but his government should and will fall. You know, there's no question mm -hmm. that that's going to happen. And if you look at the historical curve since the Cold War, uh, autocratic governments have fallen where there's been less U.S. military involvement 
direct military involvement right. than well, when we may I, had may troops I on, this, on the ground. May I, on this Mother's Day, one of my favorite philosophical quotes is from Martin Luther King, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. So let's hope right. in Venezuela and well everywhere said. else it bends towards justice. Carlos, Mike, thanks for coming in. Great, Great to, to have, have you here. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day to your <laughs> Thank women. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next. Ultra pulled the plug on its music on Virginia Key. That included future millions for an African-American museum there. What now is next? This live look from all of our tower cams across South Florida just show hot, 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 hot. Hot and sunny, beautiful, and here is Weather Authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the official Sunday forecast. Hey, Brandon. Hey, guys, we're about to add some thunderstorms into the mix, too. Maybe cool things down a little bit. 88 degrees so far, and we're still rising, but it's at humidity makes it feel more like 96 degrees. That's the heat index in Miami, at least for right now. So we'll get some storms popping up. I'm guessing within the next hour to two hours inland and then slowly drifting towards the coast. But these are going to be some slow movers. So watch out for some very frequent lightning out of some of this should start to subside around 9 10 o'clock once we lose the heating of the day, but could contain some strong gusty winds and even some very heavy rain could see some minor flooding 91 close to 92 for high temperatures today and it keeps on going there 93 tomorrow and that would tie the record high temperature that was just set two years ago. So we're looking at a nice three day streak of low 90s in the forecast, a little bit cooler towards the end there, but storm chances continue through next weekend. All right, thanks, Brandon. Ultra Music Festival sudden thanks but no thanks departure from Miami got a lot of attention this week. Some of the collateral damage of that, not so much. Anyone who may not be familiar with the agreement that moved that iconic event to Virginia Key this year might not know that half of Ultra's licensing fee to the city, a million dollars, was earmarked as finally seed money for a long planned African American museum in historic Virginia Key Beach Park. 
Pictures from the Parks Trust there document Virginia Key Beach history as Miami-Dade County's Blacks Only Beach during segregation, a really ugly time in history, but from which families created their own beautiful memories. Those journeys are part of the fabric of generations in our community. Preserving and telling that history in a museum there has been a plan and a goal for more than a decade. Miami-Dade County has been sitting with more than $15 million to build that museum, but won't without funding to operate it. And that sounds like good financial common sense, but where was that sense when the county built, for instance, the Science Museum before securing operating funds for that? That construction budget needed a bailout too. And before that, they built the Carnival Center, now the Arch Center, hundreds of millions over budget and without a dedicated operating stream. Earlier, you heard Miami's mayor say the million dollar payment from Ultra has already been delivered to the Virginia Key Beach Trust. It should stay earmarked for that museum. The county bo bond money is there to build it. The plans are drawn. The effort is going on 15 years now. How great would it be to see everyone in the community who values each other's culture and history to step up and support that African American museum in Virginia Key Beach Park Shovel in the sand, ASAP. Amen. <laughs> and that is our show for today. Catch any of our shows on local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next week. Also, you can log on and uh, tune in to our podcast, This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast. Do that.